So happy to have everybody join us this hour, especially so thankful for our brothers and sisters that uh, tune in from overseas. Well, I'm so happy to have Bible study with you. Uh, such an encouragement that uh, you are asleep is not as much it's not as much as important than your intake of the word of God. To so join hands with us from across the sea is such a, an encouragement. The Bible says, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light to my path. Your word have I stored in my soul that I may not sin against you. Sanctify them with your word. For your word is the truth. Grass with us, flower fades, but the word of God will abide forever. He will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusted in thee. Let's bow our heads as we ask God to sanctify our time. Holy God, we have come here this hour. Uh, we have gathered to hear you speak to us through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, who authored the scripture. 2,000 years ago plus, the New Testament there is, and the one who wrote the entire Bible for many, many years, even before then. And we ask that he will open our eyes to what he wrote through the hands of your children, that it will benefit all of us as we study your word, this great book that you ask us to study, even put a a paragraph of blessing to those who study it and to those who teach it. So we ask that your Holy Spirit will help us open our eyes to your truth in Christ's name. Amen. I will begin by reading this uh, seven profound, these seven profound quotes. Uh, I have uh, these uh, profound quotes to share with you. One, obey God and leave all the consequences to him. Obey God and leave all the consequences to him. That's a, that's a quote. Two, another quote, we must remember that the shortest distance between our problems and their solutions is the distance between our knees and the floor. That's a very good quote. the shortest distance between our problems and their solutions is the distance between our needs and the floor. Three, the third quote, our willingness to wait, our willingness to wait reveals the value we place on the object we are waiting for. Our willingness to wait reveals the value that we place on the object that we're waiting for. And the fourth quote is this, the time you spend alone with God will transform your character and increase your devotion. Then your integrity and godly behavior in an unbelieving world will make others long to know the Lord. That, that's for me, that's a profound quote. I will repeat that quote again. The time, the time you spend alone with God will transform your character and increase your devotion. Then your integrity and godly behavior in an unbelieving world will make others long to know the Lord. The fifth quote, we can be tired, weary, and emotionally distraught, but often spending time alone with, with God, we find that he injects into our bodies energy, power, and strength. That's another good quote. And the sixth quote, Helen Keller was blind and deaf when she graduated from college with honors. So, What's your problems? 
So what's your problem? That's another quote. In other words, he gave us a person who was blind and deaf, yet he graduated from college with honors. You who is who you who are not blind and not deaf. What's your problem? The final quote is this is profound. The circumstances and the events that we see as setbacks are oftentimes the very thing that land us into a period of intense spiritual growth. I will, I will repeat that last one. The circumstances and the events that we see as setbacks are oftentimes the very things that land us into period, into periods of intense spiritual growth, into intense periods of spiritual growth. Who said those quotes? I'm sure you may have heard one of those quotes or two of them. And that was Dr. Charles Stanley, who, who many of you know, a great servant of God who was called home to be with the Lord. And uh, he, he has departed and has left footprints in the sands of time. And I'm sure his messages will continue to air even though he is absent from the body and face-to-face uh, -face with the Lord Jesus Christ in a place of no more sorrow, no more pain. All things have passed away. And we, on this side of the planet, we will miss him as a, as a, a profound soldier of Christ, a faithful one, may I add, one who represented Christ well and focused on just bringing glory and honor to God in his ministry. And so we can say farewell until we see again. Charles Stanley has gone to be with the, the Lord. These are his quotes. And he had many more. The premillennial repass, the premillennial repass. Revelation chapter 14, verses 14 through 20. The premillennial reapers. Revelation chapter 14 answers two important questions in our study. One, what happens to the 144,000 Jewish believers? The 144,000 evangelists, the 144,000 that God set aside in, in Revelation chapter 7, he set them aside, and in verse 3, he marked them. He sealed them before the tribulation began. He sealed them. And they will be the evangelists of the tribulation era. They will bring the gospel to those who are dying without Christ. And this, what happened to them? Uh, Revelation 14 tells us, uh, as we saw in our previous uh, studies, they were kept intact by the power of God, by the power of God. Their, their safety reminds us who is in charge. Satan is not in charge of our destiny. God is in charge of our destiny. The very God who called us into fellowship with his son is the very one who will keep us to the end. As, as First Peter 1 5 tells us, we are kept by the power, not the power of angels, but by the power of God himself. Every believer in the Lord Jesus Christ is kept by the power. John 10 verse 28, Jesus himself said it so plainly, I give them eternal life they will never perish. In fact, the Greek word there is stronger than English. They will never not ever perish. Uh, there is nothing that will make them to perish. They will never 
ever perish. And then he goes on to say that no one will snatch them out of my hand. No one. Not even the person who I'm, who, whom I'm holding will not snatch himself out of my hand. No one means everybody, including the one who is being held. No one will snatch them out of my hand. And then if that were not enough, he goes on to say, my father who gave them to me is also omnipotent. And he's holding that believer in his hand. And so that's you as a believer held by the Lord Jesus Christ. And the father reaches out and holds you at the same time to ensure that there's no slipping away from those two omnipotent hands. And that's a guarantee that once you are in the hand of Christ, he grips you that nothing can snatch you out of his hand. What about your failures? You fail, he will still hold you. But on the other hand, he will use his whip of divine discipline to whip you. As Hebrews 12 tells us, he, heaps, he, he will heap you, skin you alive, but he still loves you. For those he loves, his skins are alive. So you don't, get out, you don't get away by saying, well, I'm gripped, I'm not falling away. Therefore, I can live anyhow I want to live. The Bible never teaches that. If you, if you want to live in that manner, my friend, you will pay a heavy price in your spiritual journey, in your spiritual journey. Uh, and then what happens, what happens to Satan and his minions plus the unsaved? Again, Revelation answers that, Revelation chapter 14 answers that question. As we saw in the past, the, the, Lord, will deal, the Lord will deal with them and, and, and will bring an end to their, uh, to their woes on the planet Earth. In, in my preparation this, this hour, I examined a good number of co commentaries. I ex examined a good number of commentaries uh, uh, on our subject. Great scholars like uh, Woodward and uh, Ironside and many others. Uh, and I tried to see how they uh, collaborated or how they handled the remaining issue of our subject, the what I call the premillennial reapers, the premillennial reapers. Uh, and they, they, are, they did an excellent job, but there, there were some questions left unanswered. There were some questions left without profound answer. I wasn't satisfied, not that, uh, like I said, they did an excellent job. They did a very good job. One of the questions, in fact, when I look at other scholars and how the some scholars in our in our passage that we'll be going to look here uh, say that uh, believers will be judged in, in the millennial reign of Christ, in the tribulation. There is no basis no biblical support that believers living in the tribulation will be judged. And some, uh, and some scholars or Bible teachers say that believers, that will be the time the believers will be rescued in the middle of the tribulation. Again, there is no biblical support for that. And so that's, that's why we should be very careful as we go through this passage. First of all, let's read through Revelation chapter 14 verses 14 through 20, so that when I'm speaking, you will have a reference to what we are discussing this hour. And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and sitting on the cloud was unlike a son of man, having a golden crown on his head, and a sharp sickle in his hand. And another angel came out of the temple, crying out with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, put in your sickle and reap, because the hour to reap has come, because the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he who sat on the cloud 
swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was ripped. And another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, and he also had a sharp sickle. And another angel, the one who has power over fire, came out from the altar, and he called with a loud voice to him who had a sharp sickle, saying, Put in your sharp sickle and gather the clusters from the vine of the earth, because he her grapes are ripe. And, and the angel swung his sickle to the earth and gathered the clusters from the vine of the earth and threw them into the great wine press of the wrath of God. And the wine press was trodden outside the city, and blood came out from the wine press up to the horses' bridles for a distance of 200 miles for a distance of 200 miles. Like I said, I examined a quite number of uh, commentaries. And uh, this passage, when you look at it, uh, there are some terminologies or some words like vine uh, and the uh, fruit and the uh, ripe and all those things that we really need to pay attention to. Some scholars, when they, when they see the word vine, as we saw in our text, uh, they say that the vine represents the Jews, the Israelites, because the Bible uses the word vine to represent them. And that's true. In the Old Testament, the Bible uses the word vine to represent the people of Israel. Also, the vine is also represent the church, which, which is made up of Gentiles, and Jesus Christ spoke of the vine, I am the true vine, and you are the branches. And so, but the question that confronts us is, would the Jews be judged in the millennial reign of Christ? Would they be gathered and then put into wine press and be trodden uh, upon food by the justice of God? I don't think so. Uh, I don't think so. Uh, and I will tell you why, like, like, again, when I looked at the interpretations and the comment, commentaries of uh, great scholars, and that's the question that I'm not satisfied when they answered it. Uh, the question, the, the reason why I'm saying this is this. There is a, a passage in the scripture that said, all the Israelites would, will be saved, that's future. Turn with me to Romans chapter 11, verse 25. What we are doing here, we are studying the word of God. Part of studying the word of God is taking your time, looking at the scripture with another pair of glasses. The same scripture you have read before, you want to read it again when you are doing Bible study. Revelation, uh, uh, Romans eleven twenty-five. This is what Paul says about Israel. For I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery, lest you be wise in your own estimation that a partial hardness has happened to Israel. Hardness has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. In other words, Israel is in a period of hardness right now. It began from the time of the apostles. The, the time of the church to this very day, the time of the Gentiles, there is a hardness. That's why no matter what you talk to Israel, Israelites as a whole, they don't see anything about the truth. They, they can't reconcile Isaiah with the New Testament. They can't reconcile Isaiah with the prophecy of the Messiah going to the cross and the paying for our sins. They, can, they can't because of that Hardiness. And Paul said in verse 26, and thus all Israel will be saved. Thus all Israel will be saved just as it's written, the deliverer, Jesus, will come from Zion. 
he will remove ungodliness from Jacob. When will that be? From the time Paul wrote this, there has never been a record where all Israelites were saved. None. But when would that be? The only, the only window we have for the fulfillment of this passage would be in the tribulation. Remember, the tribulation belongs to them. It is called the time of Jacob suffering, the time of Jacob labor, the time of Jacob trouble. That's what the Bible calls it, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. The tribulation was the seven years that the Israelites failed in God's program. And God reserved that seven years for them to fulfill the gospel, which they failed for so many centuries. And so uh, during this period of time, Israel, by the help of the 144,000, will evangelize the world. And of course, uh, another uh, angel, as we saw, will come and help them take the gospel to the uttermost part of the earth. Jesus said, this gospel will reach every nook and corner until he returns. And so when that happens, Jesus said, when that happens, then the returning will ensue. When will that happen? It will happen in the tribulation. We saw it last week. A special angel will be sent and he will blast the word to every soul that lives at that particular, at that point of time. And so as we look at this, uh, we try to answer the question, what happens to, to the Israelites or to the Jews who will remain on the planet Earth? So what, happen, what will happen to the unbelievers? Those are the two questions primarily that we will answer this evening. So take your seats and uh, let me walk you through the last event leading up to this setting up of God's Christ kingdom. The, the event leading to the setting up of Christ's kingdom. Remember, at the rapture, before the tribulation begins, because we will never, believers will never be the objects of internal condemnation. We will never be the objects of internal condemnation. That's what the Bible says. It is in 2 Thessalonians, we, will, we won't be the object of God's wrath. We will be removed by the rapture. First Thessalonians 4, verse 14. Paul tells us uh, when the trumpet will sound, the archangel will descend from heaven with a, with a sound of trumpet. Then he, the, the, those who died in Christ will rise first. And we, Paul puts himself in the bracket thinking that he will be still alive when the rapture will occur. So that's one of the reasons why we believe that the rapture has no prophecy waiting for it to be fulfilled. The, the rapture could have occurred in the time of Paul. Even John himself who wrote this at the end, he said, Lord, come soon. Yeah, soon is still soon. Uh, that's why he said that the rapture is imminent. There is no prophecy in the Bible we are waiting so that once it fin is fulfilled, ah, we can say the rapture uh, can now take place. Some people say that the, the Israelites going back to the land is a sign that the rapture is about, not according to my Bible. There is nothing in the Bible, no prophecy, nothing that the war is being intensified. That's not a clue. Jesus Christ said no, no one knows the time. No, not the, 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 he said that it will happen like a twinkle of an eye, like lightning, shrimp, no sign. And the, all, all the saints in Christ will be raptured out of this world into the presence of God for evaluation. Seven years evaluation to see how we served Jesus Christ here on planet Earth. So what happens is that we are all in heaven with Christ. Uh, First Thessalonians 4 verse 14. Then seated with him Colossians 3, verse 
4 tells us we will, when he appears, when we, he returns, we will be returning with him in his glory. Uh, the same in, in Revelation chapter 19, verses 7 through 9, and verses 11 through 14. That answers the question, who will be returning from uh, heaven here on earth with Jesus Christ? Of course, Jesus tells us his angels will return with him. And in addition to that, the church will be returning with him. In Jude, Jude 1, 14 and 15 says that he will be returning with his saints. He will be returning with his saints. Remember, he already promised us. Jesus promised us through the apostle Paul in 2 Timothy 2, verse 12. He says, if we endure, if we endure, we will reign with him. We will reign with him. When would that be? When will, we, when will we reign with Christ or rule with Christ? When would that be? Well, at least I know we're not going to be reigning with him in heaven. He will be here on earth. And then if we are, some scholars, some Bible teachers don't believe that believers will return to hell, from heaven to earth. So I, mean, I, was, I, was, I was stunned when I was reading some commentaries. Some believe that believers who we are raptured or who went into heaven will remain in heaven when Christ returns here. So Christ will be ruling here on earth and we will be in heaven. I don't know what we'll be doing in heaven, just wandering around without our Savior. That doesn't make sense. Does it make sense to you? No. We will all return here. In fact, Jesus told his disciples, if for those of you who have, uh, who have followed me, when I return and set up my kingdom, you will sit on the 12 tribes of Israel and you'll be ru ru ruling these 12 tribes. And I, I can assure you the 12 tribes will not be in heaven. It will be here on the planet Earth. So that's why it is important for us to expose ourselves to the teaching of the word of God, to expose ourselves constantly to sound biblical teaching, to sound biblical teaching. So again, what will happen? What will happen is this. Once the time the believers are removed, tribulation will trigger seven years. And we have gone through the mid tribulation will become so much intense. As we see, as we see in this chapter 14, we are reading, we have read now, is, is the overall picture. Now John sees the whole picture of how it will all end before Jesus Christ comes to set up his kingdom. And that's why, that's why I call it premillennial reapers. Premillennial reapers, which that is judgment. Premillennial, there, there, there will be reapers before the millennial reign of Christ comes in. There will be reapers. Reapers means there will be purging. There will be getting away the, the, the fruit, the overripe fruit, the fruit that doesn't belong, is overripe, it's no good anymore, as, as indicated by our text. So those are the things that will, will uh, happen. When Jesus returns, when he comes down from heaven, he will do two things. One, he will fight for the Israelites who will be backed, whose back will be backed against the wall, so to say, or so to speak. All the enemies of the Jews will come in Jerusalem and they will want to squeeze them that they, they will have no place to go but to die. It's like the, the Israelites crossing the Red Sea. The, 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 the Egyptians were pursuing them with all alacrity, as, as, as they approached, as they approached the Red Sea, the Israelites were between their enemy 
uh, sandwiched between Red Sea and the enemy, know where to go, know where to go. They knew that was the end of the rope. They knew that their end had come. Uh, and they knew that they didn't need it. And that's, that's when they started asking Moses, we are not, if we had died in Egypt, at least we would have gotten some graves. We would have, it would have been better. And what did Moses do? They, 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 they punched Moses. Moses didn't punch back to them. Moses punched back to God. and said, God, you, you started this. What do we do? And God told Moses what to do. And we know the rest of the story. God brought safety. And his people walked across the Red Sea on a dry land. Not a drop of water touched them. Because God is control of both dry land and the sea itself. Uh, and what happened to the enemy? As they, 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 they tried to follow the same pathway that the Israelites followed to safety. And God pulled back the curtain and brought back the, the, the river and the ocean drowned them. They were drowned in the sea. And so that's the picture of what we see in the end of time when Satan and his minions will come to squeeze Israel, to kill them, to annihilate them, to finish them up, so that the promise of God to Israel will not happen. And Satan will celebrate victory. Would that happen? How possible is that? That Satan will have his way? Not a chance. That's when Jesus Christ will descend in the Battle of Armageddon. That's when he, when, this is just a, a preview when we get to chapter 19, 16, we'll have a little bit pinch, but in 19, we will see this broad battle of Armageddon and see the bad blood the, or the bloodbath of people who hated the Jews or hated Israel and Jesus will fight for them and deliver them. But at the same time, at the same time after the fight, that's when Jesus Christ will be revealed in his glory. As he descends from heaven, his hands pierced an internal mark. Jesus is the only one that will have sky for all eternity. As a reminder of the cost of our so great salvation. As Jesus Christ descends, spectacularly, in Matthew chapter 24, there will be wonders in heaven preparing for this uh, this ushering of us of our of the king of kings and th that wondrous sign will cause the jews to look up and the jewel tells us when they see they will see the one they pierced they will see the very son of god they rejected zechariah chapter 12 Zechariah chapter 12, when you have time, read the whole chapter. In Zechariah chapter 12, Zechariah chapter 12 tells us about the battle of Armageddon, how Jesus will come to rescue his people. And it is after this rescue, when they say, Hosanna, saved us now, uh, the salvation will come to them. And they will look upon him and they will realize that truly, truly, we, we killed him. We who nailed him to the cross. This is our Messiah, but we nailed him. When they are saying all this, they are coming to time to faith, which is the only requirement for salvation. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. No one has ever been saved apart from faith alone in Christ alone. Faith alone in Yahweh alone. Faith alone in Jesus Christ alone. The same way you and I are saved, is the same way they will be saved. The same way uh, the Abraham and Eve were saved in the garden by believing in Yahweh, is the same way every person on the planet Earth will receive eternal life uh, if the person is to escape internal doom that is coming to face the planet Earth. And so that, that is the, the picture. The Jews will be saved. Once they see this sign and hit their chest, according to the passage I just told you, it says that there'll be weeping. And that weeping signifies acceptance 
For Jesus Christ cannot set up a kingdom to rule them until they have accepted him as their king. He came the first advent, they rejected him. So he, he postponed the kingdom. And then he's going to come up again to set up that kingdom they rejected. At this time, they will recognize because it's called in Zechariah, spirit of grace. God will unveil and open their eyes to see that hardness of heart will finally give way. Uh, and it will melt to the point of embracing what God did for them. And that, that embracing by faith will usher them into God's kingdom. And Jesus will begin ruling this planet Earth for 1,000 years, but he will begin it with perfect environment. We will get to that in a moment. So the reapers, who are the reapers? A, Christ himself. Verse 14, and I looked and behold a white cloud and sitting on the cloud was one like a son of man, one like a son of man, no other than Jesus himself, sitting on a cloud, having a golden crown on his head. Remember when Jesus Christ came the first time, they placed a crown of mockery on his head. But this time he's coming with a golden crown of victory, a golden crown of victory to rule this planet Earth. And he sits on the cloud. Of course, the Son of Man is his uh, uh, Davidic title. The Son of Man is his, uh, was his title in his prayer incarnate. In fact, Matthew alone used it more than 25 times in the book of Matthew, Son of Man. And he, Jesus Christ referred to himself. He never called himself son of God. He always calls himself son of man. Uh, people have already debated that Jesus never called himself son of God. He alluded to be son of God. In fact, the, the closest he came to calling himself son of God was when he was asked, turn with me to Luke 22 verse 70, he was asked, are you the son of God? During his trial, they asked him point blank, tell us, are you the son of God? Either you, either he, you are or you are not. Tell us point blank. And then let, let's see what Jesus answered them in Luke chapter 22, verse 70. And they all said, are you the son of God? Are you the son of God then? In fact, in fact, they asked him the first question in verse 67. If you are the Christ, tell us. But he said to them, if I tell you, you will not believe. And if I ask a question, you will not answer. He comes close again in verse 69. But from now on, the son of man will be seated at the right hand of the power of God. So he calls himself the son of man. They turn around, they knew what he was talking about. They turn around point blank in verse 70. And they all said, are you the son of God then? And he said to them, yes, I am. How can you get around that? And that's the closest he he came to telling people that he is the son of God. Are you the son of God? He said, yes, I am. And that was the time the, the priest tore their robe, his robe and said, what other evidence do we need? We heard it from his mouth. He made a claim to be son of God, which is blasphemy in the Jewish law. And that's the, what they gripped to be capital punishment against Jesus. And so Jesus would be descending on the crowd and another angel came out of the temple crying out with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud put in your sickle and reap because the hour to reap has come the hour to reap has come because the harvest of the earth is ripe the harvest the harvest here is alludes is to the work of 
harvest judgment. It is not the harvest of believers. Remember, at this time, many believers have died in the tribulation, especially those who refused to receive a mark, which we have already seen in our study, a believer can never receive the mark 666, the mark of the beast. That, that's finished. We, we are done away with. Why? Because we have already been sealed by the Holy Spirit. There, there is no other sealing. What sealing is more is omnipotent. We've already been sealed by the omnipotent Holy Spirit. What other sealing that is more powerful than the Holy Spirit that we can seal on top of the Holy Spirit? <laughs> that's finished. That, that's over. We will never undergo that again. Once you believe in Christ, you are sealed. We see the 144,000. None of them received the number 666. None. Zero. Why? Because they were sealed by God and kept by his power. And so the reaper, the, the, it says here, uh, and the, the, the word ripe, the scholars pointed out something very significant. That word ripe is, an, uh, is a kind of a negative connotation. It's not ripe like uh, you see uh, orange is ripe, let's go eat. No, it, it's, it, here it means something that is withered, something that is withered, or, or something that is overripe, overripe. And so it's, 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 not, it's, it's, it's not even good anymore, kind of. And so that's a reference to unbelievers. That's a reference to unbelievers. There will be ripping of uh, the unbelievers, not believers, not believers. Daniel 7, 13 and 14 also made mention of Jesus Christ as the son of man. The second reapers were the three angels, that's B, the three angels, verses 15 to 20. And another angel came out of the temple, crying out with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud. Put in, put in your sickle and reap because the hour to reap has come because the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he who sat on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth and the earth was, was reaped. And another angel came out of the temple which is in heaven and he also had a sharp sickle and another angel, the one who has power over fire came out from the altar and he called with a loud voice to him who had a sharp sickle saying, put in your sharp sickle and gather the clusters from the vine of the earth because her grapes are ripe. You see, gather the, club, gather the, uh, the, the, the clusters gather the clusters with your with your with your sickle no gather them what are you going to do with them if they are believers why are you gathering them the the the, the next passage answers the question uh, verse 19 and the angel swung his sickle to the earth and gathered the clusters from the vine of the earth and threw them into the great wine press of the wrath of god that's not a good place to put on believer to put a believer. No, you put unbelievers in that wine press, and the sovereign power, the sovereignty of God, the foot of the sovereignty of God, we pounce, we go through rotten grapes, which is a metaphor of divine judgment, divine judgment, the wrath of God, and the wine press was trodden outside the city and blood came out from the wine press up to the horses' bridles for a distance of 200 miles. There's going to be literally, literally there's going to be bloodbath, no doubt about it, as the final, final stage of the tribulation Sitting. What, what John is showing us here is the final picture. 
This is, this is just a picture. We have one more, uh, one more. We are waiting on, remember, we are waiting on that uh, bow, the seventh bow. And once, once we get to chapter 16, the seventh bow kicks up, opens. And from there on, all the way till Jesus returns, everything will just be flowing. There, there, no, there is no more delay by God. God's judgment will come to the earth in full force. Again, what that brings us again to the questions, what happens before Jesus returns? One, Jesus will take part in the war of Armageddon. Jesus will take part in the war of Armageddon. Two, the unbelievers would undergo baptism of fire. The unbelievers would undergo baptism of fire. Remember those, those days when I didn't know much, didn't know better. Uh, we, will, we will gather at the altar and we'll be praying, oh God, baptize us with fire. Because we saw Matthew chapter 3, verse 11, it talks about when Jesus, Jesus will, baptize, will baptize you with baptism of fire. And then we will pray and say, God, baptize us with fire. Thank God he didn't baptize us with fire. Otherwise, we will be ashes. Every one of us will become ash, ash in the, the heap of ash before the altar in our church. But he didn't. What is baptism of fire? Baptism of fire is the removal of unbelievers. Removal of unbelievers by the judgment of fire. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 3. So that tomorrow before you pray, baptize you with the fire. You just know what you are asking God to do. You are asking for judgment. That is still future. Matthew chapter 3. Verse 11 says, as for me... I baptize you, this is John speaking, with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, and I'm not fit to remove his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit first. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit, speaking to believers. And then, and fire, two works of our Lord Jesus Christ, baptism of the Holy Spirit, which is, entrance of believers into the body of Christ by the Holy Spirit and fire. The, that one and the fire is the one, is our context. That one is waiting at the end of time. It's waiting at the end of time. And that's a, a hard not truth to many people who have been exposed or who have been made to believe that baptism of fire is meant for believers. Not according to my scripture. Now let's begin to look at other passages of scripture. See, verse 12 again. And his, now verse 12 even explain it even more. And his winnowing fork is in his hand, referring to Jesus. And he will thoroughly clear his threshing floor and he will gather his wheat into the barn but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. You can say he will baptize them with fire. Uh, talking about unbelievers, the chaff. Uh, the, the, pause for a moment. What this picture is showing us is before Jesus Christ enters into this world to rule it, it will be purged. All unbelievers will not be here. Those unbelievers that were left during the tribulation who didn't believe in Christ before he came, before he returns, they will be pushed out by fire. That is the baptism of fire. They will be clothed with fire. Baptism of fire. They will be removed. Before I go even further, turn to chapter 13, verse 40. Chapter 13, verse 40. The same place, Matthew 13, verse... Matthew chapter 13, Verse 30, rather. It says, Allow both to grow together together until the harvest. Harvest again, judgment. And in the, in the time of the harvest, 
I will say to the reapers, reapers, we just saw a word here, reapers, first, gather up the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them up. You see, gather the tares to burn them. They, they must be burned, which, which signifies that the that our Lord will remove all unbelievers before he enters into the world to rule it. No unbeliever will be left here on the planet Earth before Jesus Christ rules it. So let's, we, we run out of our time. Again, the unbelievers will be undergo baptism of fire, Matthew 11, 3, 11, 3, 11 and 12. 13, 38 through 43, 24, Matthew 24, verse 40. Matthew 24, verse 40. In Matthew 24, verse 40, the Lord himself said it so plainly. Then there shall be two men in the field, one will be taken and one will be left. Two men in the field, one taken, one left. Who is taking the chaff, the tear, not the believer, taken, removed from this world, from this planet Earth, into a place of torment, temporary torment until the end of 1,000 years when Jesus will now throw Satan into the lake of fire and all the minions, all the unsaved will join him in the lake of fire. But temporary, they will be removed. Remember, Satan was already removed. When Jesus returns, he will remove Satan. He won't be here on earth. He will be chained for 1,000 years. That's the only time Satan can be chained. And some believers who have no clue of what the Bible is teaching are binding Satan. Satan will bind you. You bind him with what? For how long? How is he, how, how is he that he's doing more uh, chaotic work while millions of Christians are binding him. No, you cannot bind him. You don't have the power to bind him. The only one that has power to bind him is Jesus Christ. And a special chain has been reserved to bind Satan for 1,000 years and put him out of action. He will not torment the world for 1,000 years. That is the teaching of the word of God. That is the truth of the word of God. Three, Christ's glorious appearance will trigger a national salvation for Israel. Christ's glorious appearance will trigger a national salvation for Israel. Romans 11, 25 and 26. Zechariah chapter 12, verses 1 through 11. Now, our time has caught up with us, but quickly, let's put down these points of truths and principles. Points of truths and principles. There are six of them. One, mass judgment will occur in God's timetable. Mass judgment will occur in God's timetable. We, we can't push God to judge. We see people acting anyhow they want to act. We see people behaving anyhow they want to behave. We see the world deteriorating. We see the world getting worse and worse by the day. Stay away from that side. Focus on your own spiritual life. Man's judgment will occur in God's timetable. Two, his mercy withholds judgment until justice prevails. His mercy withholds judgment until justice prevails. Second Chronicles 36, 15 through 18. Let me explain number two. There is a conflict. Let me put it in my own time. There's a conflict between justice and mercy, and they are fighting. 
The mercy is withholding judgment. Justice is saying, God, take mercy away. Let me, let me, the man has failed. Man has sinned. Man has violated the righteousness of God. Take, take that mercy away so that I will accomplish my purpose as the justice. My purpose is to punish, to discipline the justice of God. Take that away. Well, God continues to hold that mercy, keeping us from getting what we desire. One day, one day, one day, mercy will give way and the justice of God will prevail and the judgment will come upon unbeliever or, unbeliever, unbeliever or upon the sinner. That's what we find in 2 Chronicles 36, 15 through 18. Number three, sin will never go unpunished. Sin will never or can never go unpunished. Psalm 37, verse 9, Isaiah 28, verses 15 through 18. Just because we are swimming in the, we are swimming in the pool of sin and nothing is happening, and you, 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 you say, oh, I, no, I'm fine. Nothing is my natural life. It's my, what I plan to do. Just remember, one day, the mercy of God will give way to the justice of God. Number four, premillennial judgment, premillennial judgment gives way to Christ's return. Premillennial judgment gives way to Christ's return. Christ will return to rule this planet Earth under perfect environment. And the, the judgment, the, pre, the, the premillennial judgment, which we are seeing here in Revelation, will set that up. It will clear the way. It will remove the chaff. All unbelievers will be removed, crushed. We saw that bloodbath. In the in the uh, when you see it in, even in Zechariah in the you call it Megiddo, which is a, a Megiddo. And so you're going to see. We haven't come to that yet. We are going to. I can't wait when we get to chapter 19. We are going to see this battle we've been talking about a Megiddo, a Megiddo, a Megiddo. What is it? We will catch up with that in the latter part of our study. So, for premillennial judgment gives way to Christ's return. The judgment must take place first, which is what John is showing us in, in chapter 14 of Revelation, before Christ comes in. When Christ comes in, all unbelievers are gone. Number five, unbelievers will, will, be, purged, will be purged by a baptism of fire. Unbelievers will be purged by a baptism of fire. Matthew 3, 11 and 12. Matthew 13, 38 through 43, Matthew 24, 40. Finally, six. Millennial kingdom will begin with a perfect environment. Millennial kingdom will begin with a perfect environment. Turn with me as we close this section to Psalm 119. Verse 119. 119, 119. A good, good, uh, good combination. Psalm 119, 119. The psalmist tells us, Thou hast removed, listen carefully, thou or you, thou is usually fine English, thou or you have removed all the wicked of the earth like dross. Therefore, I, lie, I love thy testimonies. When would that be? You have removed all the wickedness of all the wicked people of this earth. That is the purging out of all unbelievers. Two will be in the farm. One unbeliever will be removed and one believer will be left to join Jesus Christ in the millennial reign of his kingdom. This is remarkable. That's incredible. That's something to look forward to. Jesus, the world has been, we have been sandwiched. The world is full of chaos. 
everywhere you turn, you turn on the television, you turn on the radio, every in, in, in Ukraine, in Russia, in Rwanda, in Africa, and so many other countries, you just see wars, rumors of war, as Jesus said. They, they, nothing gives you good news anymore. The only good news we have is Jesus Christ saves. To trust him means eternal life. To reject him is not a good news. It's in internal condemnation. That's good news that Jesus has paid for our sins. We don't have to struggle. That's good news. That's the only good news that we have left going for us. Every other thing, uh, stock market collapse, bank collapse, all these things collapse, food going up, everything uh, to the high, uh, hitting the ceiling. That's not good news. But our confidence is that Jesus Christ controls history. And one day he's going to manifest his glorious power here on planet Earth. And all these wars will be brought to his Christian heart. He says there will be rumors of war until Jesus returns, the Prince of Peace. There can never be true peace on planet Earth until Jesus, the Prince of Peace, sets his foot here on Earth to rule this planet Earth again, restoring what was lost in the Garden of Eden, restoring perfect environment that was lost by Adam and Eve's sin. At this time, that's when children can play with cobra. Uh, children don't, if you, if you see cobra, don't go close, that will be the last time you try. That will be the, that was the time when children can play with lions. Don't do it now. Even if he's sleeping, don't try to touch sleeping lion. That may be the last time you try. At that time, there will be no more wars. The, 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 the arrows will be turned into pruning hooks. And all these swords will be turned into pruning hooks. There will be no more war. No more fighting. The righteous, the king of righteousness has begun to rule. This planet Earth for 1,000 years. And we will be in our resurrected bodies ruling with him, ruling with him. That's something to look forward to. The world has nothing to offer us, nothing, by way of comparison what Jesus has to offer to us, both now and the future. And so as we are all marching forward, keep your eyes on the prize. Keep your eyes beyond here. Nothing, we see people move one by one into internal state. And I just mentioned to you uh, a friend, just uh, uh, Stanley, who has departed to be with the Lord. He cannot minister here again. His ministration has come to a screeching heart. His work, as Jesus said, we must do the work of the one who called us. A time is coming. A day is coming, a night is coming when no man will work. His own night has come. Your night is coming. My night is coming. The remaining time we have, the window we have, let us work. Work to leave a legacy behind us, to leave our footprints in the sands of a time that will be taken into eternity. You and I, let's not allow things to distract us. Let us not allow the, 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 the worries and the, all these things flying around us. Let them not be a distraction. Let us focus our eyes on the Lord, the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Let's keep marching forward, knowing that one day, all these things that I, I'm teaching will all come behind us and we will stand in front of our Savior where he can say to us, well done, good and faithful servant. Again, I call upon my brother Babs to close us in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the book of Revelation that teaches us that history is moving towards a purposeful end. One that will give you glory because you control history. We thank you, Father, for the sealing that you have placed us in, nothing can take us out because your omnipotent power keeps us 
under that seal. Thank you for the love of Christ. Thank you for what you're doing on our behalf. May this encourage us today. May this make us become more and more like you as we continue in your word. May it strengthen us, we ask you, in all our endeavors. Thank you, Father, as we spread your word and your gospel of truth to those that are in need, that they may come to know you. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, brothers and sisters. Until we meet again. Good night and good morning.